edition of our weekly message and fellowship. Uh, before I share the message the Lord has laid in my heart, I want to check in with you to be sure you are well and prospering in faith. I know that in this unusual period we are in, God is manifesting his faithfulness, his goodness, and his sure mercies to you and to me and our families. I pray that God will continue to take you from faith to faith, from grace to grace, and from glory to glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's have a word of prayer before I share the message the Lord has laid in my heart for us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father and our God, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to your people again. I never take it for granted. Father, please come and speak through me. Let me speak as an oracle of God. I let go and I let God. I want to speak the words you have laid in my heart. And I want these words to prosper in our lives. Let these words germinate in us and be a maximum fruit. Thank you, Father, because you are the one sowing the seed of the word in our lives. And the results will bring blessings to us and glory to your name. For in Jesus' mighty name I have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the message um, I've been, that has been laid in my heart to share with us is titled, Only One Thing. Only One Thing. Now, the background to the message is as follows. As we recall, the theme for the month of June 2020 is In Step with God. In Step with God. And our main text is taken from John 17, 20 to 21. John 17, 20 to 21. I'll read, it, I'll read from the Passion Translation, the TPT version of the Bible. And I ask not only for these disciples, but also for all those who will one day believe in me through their message. 
I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. Our theme for this month, in step with God, especially when viewed in the context of the theme passage, John 17, 20 to 21, is a vast and expansive theme. It's one that we can you know, speak about or speak on for the rest of the year or even for many years. As we conclude our meditations on the theme of in step with God this month and this week, I believe the message the Lord has laid in my heart to share with us will help us grasp the essence of what it truly means and what it takes to walk in step with God. The inspiration for the message came from a Bob Gass devotional I read recently titled Only One Thing. And that is also where I got the title of the message I'm sharing with us today. Let me read that passage from Bob Gass, Only One Thing. Only One Thing. You are worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. This is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 41 to 42, NIV version. Sometimes the reason we approach God with a list of requests, the length of our arm, is because we are more interested in his presence, as in P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, than his presence, as in P-R-E-S-E-N-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, presence. We are more interested in his presence than his presence. What we consider needs are often wants. Can you imagine having only one thing on your agenda, like just wanting to be with him? David said, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that I may dwell in his presence all my life. This is taken from Psalm 27 verse 4, the Amplified Edition. Speaking of his presence, Jesus told Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. No doubt, Martha loved Jesus. In fact, she couldn't do enough for him. The problem was, she was so busy serving him that she didn't know how to relax and just enjoy being with him. Sound familiar? If you are not spending time enjoying God's presence, you are way overscheduled. Maybe like Martha, you think that unless you do the job yourself, it won't get done right. And who knows, you might be right. But remember this, God will never ask you to do anything that hinders your relationship with him. He wants that to be your top priority. Your relationship with him is what God wants you to consider your top priority. So if you are so busy serving God, that you're not doing the one thing he really wants from you, right now will be a good time to heed the words of the old hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So how about it? That old hymn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face ties in very well into the prophetic message that the Adeboye shared with us on Sunday on the theme, it is time to lift up your eyes, taken from Acts chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. That the Adeboye thought extensively, and I might add prophetically, on the benefits and possibilities of looking up and linking up with God. As a continuation of the series from lockdown to leaping up, I believe this was the third part of the series that he's been sharing with us in the previous Sundays. I encourage all of us to meditate on and digest the message that Pastor Deboer, our general overseer, shared with us. One of the passages he quoted is Mark chapter 9, verse 23, which says, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Brethren, our Father in the Lord, that Deboer is challenging you and challenging me to lift up our eyes, link up with God and the Godhead, and behold the glory of God. This is the prayer Jesus prayed to the Father for us, you know, his disciples, both then and now, in John 17. And this prayer has been answered, and we are now in the church age. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible admonishes us to look up and link up with him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. 
And this is why, you know, Pastor Deborah challenged us to say, don't limit God. Dream big. Don't dream small. Dream big. Let me drive this point home with a personal testimony, something that happened recently in the company where I work. You know, our company recently embarked on a vision and strategy exercise. You know, a vision and strategy exercise to envision what will be over the next 10 years. And in that strategy, in that vision and strategy um, process, we came up with a vision and a strategy that essentially said that we would like to be 10 times our size today and one of the top players in our, in our space, in, our, in the market where we operate in Africa. After we prepared the strategy, the vision and strategy document, we, we, we shared it with one of our mentors and senior colleagues and asked him to critique the document. And the interesting thing is that when he read it, he challenged us and said, why can't we be 100 times what we are today in 10 years? Why can't we be 100 times? And why can't we be the number one in Africa in what we do today? Because it's a very, you know, it's a large space. We're in the asset management industry. So why can't we be number one? You know, and what I find interesting about this is that it ties neatly into Pastor Devoyer's challenge to us. Don't dream small, dream big. Don't limit God, dream big. The Bible says that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. It means that anything you can think or ask, God can do more than that. And therefore, nothing that we dream of can be too big for our God. Let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, that then leads us or leads me into the title of the message for this week, which is only one thing. Because we must focus on the one thing that will link us up to our destiny, to our purpose, to the vision that heaven has for us, which is always greater and better than anything we can think or ask for ourselves. You know, and our main text is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 41 to 42. Luke 10, 41 to 42. And I'll read from the Passion Translation. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many dis distractions? Are they really that important? Mary has discovered the one thing most important. By choosing to sit at my feet, she is undistracted and I won't take this privilege from her. You know, as, we, as, as I dive, as I go further into the message, I've divided the message into three parts by way of outline. The first thing I'll focus on is the thing we must learn to focus on only one thing, or what I call the master key. We must learn to focus on only one thing or the master key. And then we'll look at some case studies that illustrate the principle, that illustrate the biblical principle of focusing on only one thing. We'll look at some case studies that illustrate the biblical principle of focusing on only one thing. And then I'll conclude by linking this message I'm sharing today to the overall theme for the month, the overall theme for the month of In Step With God. And I would also like to link it to the message I shared last week, which was titled, Tighten Your Grip on Eternal Life. Now let's go to the first part. We must learn to focus on only one thing or the master key. We must learn to focus on only one thing or what I call the master key. One of the classics in the Bible on focusing on or zeroing into one thing that produces amazing results is the prayer of Solomon, told in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. 1 Kings chapter 3, 5 to 14. In that prayer, as you will recall, the Lord appeared to Solomon. And God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, give me an understanding heart, so that I can govern your people well, and know the difference between right and wrong. The Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for a long life, or wealth, or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as no one else has, has had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Solomon's prayer has been called the prayer that answers all other prayers. When it comes to prayer, there is always a master key. When it comes to prayer, there is always a master key. A prayer that will please God and unlock answers both to what we, you prayed for and all other things that people seek in prayer. For example, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, you know, we see an example of a master key where the Bible says, 
Jesus speaking, says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. In other words, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added. That's an example of a master key when it comes to Christian living. Now, the other insight from Solomon's prayer and God's response is that God examines our motives when we pray. God is interested in the motive or what we want to do with the answers to the prayers we pray to him. As we know from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. God looks at the motive behind our prayers and what lies in our heart. You know, therefore, God is interested in the motive or what you want to do with the answers to the prayers we pray to him. Solomon prayed to God for wisdom, to be a good king, to govern the people well, and to know the difference between good and evil or right and wrong. God always answers such prayers. Brethren, remember, God always answers such prayers. Prayers that desire to do the right thing, to know good from evil, and to know right from wrong. God always answers such prayers. In fact, God more than answers such prayers. They are strategic prayers that produce results in terms of both what we have asked for, and as we see from the case of Solomon, all the other good things people normally pray for selfishly, are added just as extra when we pray those sort of strategic prayers that please God. Ask the Holy Spirit to reach you, sorry, to teach you to be strategic. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you to be strategic in your prayers like Solomon. That's one of the key takeaways from that prayer of Solomon. I read a book titled by, I read a book titled The One Thing by an author, by a gentleman called Gary Keller. The One Thing by Gary Keller. Here's a quick summary of what the book is all about. What's the one thing you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? In the number one Wall Street Journal bestseller, Gary Keller has identified that behind every successful person is their one thing. No matter how success is measured, personal or professional, only the ability to dismiss distractions and concentrate on your one thing stands between you and your goals. The one thing is about getting extraordinary results in every situation. This is a book that is easy to read and apply, and I highly recommend it. The book emphasizes the importance of learning to focus on your one thing, the one thing that will make a difference, the importance of priority, the importance of understanding, the, the one thing that will make a difference in your life. Jesus, speaking about Mary in our main text, Luke chapter 10, verse 42, said, Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted, and I won't take this privilege from her. Jesus, speaking to Martha in the same passage, on the other hand, said, Martha, my beloved Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed. Have you discovered your one thing? For a Christian, a practicing Christian, your one thing has to be, like Mary, to be in the presence of God all the time, to fellowship with Him and go on the journey of life with Him, to look up and link up with God as our Father in the Lord that the Adeboye taught us this week. This is the prayer that answers all other prayers. This is the master key to the abundant life. This is how to tighten your grip on eternal life. This is how to walk in step with God. Only one thing is needed, and it will not be taken away from you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You will walk in step with God, and you will have a deep fellowship and connection with Him in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let us now look at some more examples or illustrations of this important principle and approach to practical Christianity from the Bible. Let's study a few more examples before we bring this message to a close. The first case study we'll look at is how Moses asked God for his presence to lead his people to the promised land in Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 to 17. Exodus 33, 12 to 17, and I'll read from the NIV. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, 
do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else would distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. The one thing that Moses needed above all else in taking the children of Israel on the journey to the promised land is the presence of God. When Moses asked and prayed to God, asking who will go with us, when Moses cried to the Lord to know him, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Brethren, notice that the Lord was pleased with Moses and said, I will do the very thing you have asked because I'm pleased with you. Only one thing is needed as a Christian as you go on the journey to the promised land. Only one thing is needed as a Christian leader taking your family or your company or your team or indeed any other group of people on a journey. And that one thing is to ask for and receive the presence of God. Brethren, notice Moses' very important observations and petitions to God in Exodus 33, verse 16. Exodus 33, 16. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else would distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? I can testify that I have found out personally that it is carrying the presence of God that makes the difference. It is carrying the presence of God that makes the real difference between us as Christians and all other people on the face of the earth. If you are not carrying God's presence, there is no difference. You are just like everybody else and life becomes a very hazardous journey with no rest or peace or peace of mind or assurance that the journey shall end in praise. Let me deal with the second case study, Elisha and the sons of the prophets. This is the case of Elisha and the sons of the prophets taken from 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 1 to 7. New Living Translation. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, New Living Translation. One day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, As you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said. So he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried. It was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. One of the most important takeaways from this story of the floating axe head is the importance of inviting God on any project or journey we embark upon as his children and Christians. In the Old Testament, the prophets represented the presence of God. In the church age, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Invite God and his spirit to go with you. And when issues and problems arise, as they will inevitably arise. You can cry to him, and like Elisha, he will answer readily and speedily and tell you what to do. Again, the principle is the same. The approach is the same, and the answer is the same. Only one thing, his presence in our lives and our affairs is what makes the difference. To be in step with God is to travel with God on the journey of life. Today, do not step out without him. Do not go on this journey of life without God, without his presence. As I conclude this message, I would like to ask you, have you answered Jesus' clarion call in Matthew 11, 28 to 30? Have you answered the call of God through to all of us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30? And I'll read from the Passion Translation. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me, I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis, says the Lord. Simply join your life with mine, learn my ways, and you will discover that I am gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Jesus is inviting you to simply join your life with his life. This is part of the prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father before his departure 
from his early ministry. This is one of the final prayers of Jesus. Jesus asked the Father to bring us into fellowship with him, Jesus and the Father. What an awesome prayer. And God has answered that prayer. That's why we are very much in the church age now. That prayer is um, summarized in John chapter 17, verse 21. And I'll read from the Passion Translation. John 17, 21, TPT. I pray for them to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. Today, answer the call of Jesus. And like Mary, choose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Answer the call to simply join your life with his life. And you will find refreshment and rest. The Lord said to Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. God's presence is the one and only thing you need to enjoy the abundant life here on earth and to lay hold on eternal life. Have you answered this clarion call of Jesus? Today is the day of salvation. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? And I know that many of us will answer this call. And even if you have answered the call, today is a day you know, to deepen your relationship with him by asking for his presence to come and go with you on the journey of life. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I want to say thank you for the word you have laid in my heart to share with your people. As many as do not yet know you, as I pray for them now, Father, please come into their lives and take control. Come into their hearts and dwell in the hearts of every one of us, including the ones that will accept you as Lord and Savior today. Now, before I continue, if you know that Jesus Christ is not yet your Lord and your Savior, Please pray this part of prayer with me. Pray along with me as I pray now. Because I believe that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart right now. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, amen. My Father and my God, I ask you to come into my heart right now. I confess that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me all my sins and trespasses. Come into my heart right now and wash away all my sins and trespasses. And write my name in the book of life. Precious, sweet Holy Spirit, I invite you also to come and dwell in my heart. I invite your presence to, go, to come and go on the journey of life with me. Thank you for saving me, and thank you for your abiding presence. Take all the honor and all the glory, Father, for in Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. If you pray that prayer, I believe that Jesus has come into your heart, and you begin a journey with him, an incredible and a worthwhile journey from today. Amen. Let us pray as we round up. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you again for the word I have shared. Thank you for all that have listened and will listen to this message. May every one of us abide with you. May we convert your presence above all else. May we desire and pray and receive your presence above everything else. Because that is the prayer that answers all other prayers. And from this day forward, may we have that one thing that will bring about eternal life and give us abundant life even here on earth. Take all the honor and all the glory, Father. For in Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. May the Lord be with you. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you.